this paper um, from overloading to, to freeloading. Uh, it's part of a project, uh, another Simon Lee inspired uh, project. I feel like I'm here you know, on Simon's, uh, Simon's behalf today, but um, this comes back to the point Steve made right at the very start about the Hamilton Examiner and this 40 year project, because in the UK uh, context, 1976 was quite a significant year. And in a way, much more than 1979 probably shaped the debates um, that have dominated UK politics um, ever since. And in particular, I think the debate about the respective role of the state um, and the market. Obviously, most people are aware that 1976 was the year that the UK called in the International Monetary Fund or was forced to call in the International uh, Monetary Fund. But in some respects, what the IMF actually did really only legitimised what was already going on. Um, the UK Treasury was always or already going back to its economic um, orthodoxy in terms of cutting uh, public spending and setting cash limits um, on, on departments. But 1976 was also the year that Lord Hailsham started talking about an elective dictatorship um, in the United Kingdom. It was the year that St John Norman Stevens started talking about the end of consensus. And it was also the year that Anthony King and Samuel Britton, amongst others, posed the question, why is Britain becoming harder to govern? And there were a series of academic articles and books published around this subject or around the idea that Britain was somehow becoming ungovernable, that it was no longer actually possible to govern the UK without some kind of radically redrawn settlement and radical uh, change to the relationship between the state and the market. In the last couple of years, in fact, probably since um, 2010, really, and the, uh, the arrival of the coalition, that debate has come back again. Okay, so it's quite common now to, to hear people talk about the UK once again being um, ungovernable. Obviously this has heightened since, since Brexit, but I would argue that Brexit was really a symptom rather than a cause of Britain's um, ungovernability. And people forget that not long before that we had the Scottish referendum, where 45% of Scottish people voted um, to, uh, to end the union, or voted for Scottish um, independence. But we've seen all kinds of other problems as well. We've seen endless public policy crises. I mean, if we listed them all, we'd be here um, all day. And collectively, this has just eroded faith in Britain's political system. My paper is really about how that's explained or how leading commentators have sought to explain that. And it seems to me that those who've sought to explain it have once again gone back to 1976 for their inspiration. And in particular, they've gone back to the idea that the reason that Britain is so difficult to govern is because it's overloaded. In other words, there's a gap between the expectations of citizens about what the government ought to be delivering and what in practice the government can actually um, deliver. And just like in the 1970s, the argument is very similar, that these growing demands from the electorate are self-fulfilling. So the government responds to a new demand by granting extra expenditure to a particular group. Once that group has got that money, it becomes more powerful and it becomes a veto player in the system. It's just like a ratchet effect. Once you give the money away, you've no choice but to keep buying off those constituencies with more and more money. And the ultimate outcome of that, at least in the economic sense, is a fiscal crisis because the state just continues to grow and ultimately uh, it, the income of the state can't keep up um, with that. And so that then leads you down two routes. One in the shorter term, austerity as we've talked about it here. So cuts to uh, public expenditure and raising um, taxes. But the other thing that it leads to is an attempt again to fundamentally redraw or re-engineer the relationship between states and markets and to try to get people to rethink their expectations about what the state can and should um, be doing. My argument is that this emphasis on the demand side, this overloading, is quite convenient because it downplays what I think is the real source of the problem, which is freeloading. Now, when we talk about freeloading, uh, I was going to actually have a picture of the press up here, but the press are very good at identifying freeloaders. Freeloaders are the work shy, 
the benefit cheats, the benefit claimants, the immigrants, and so on um, and so forth. But the freeloaders that I want to talk about here, and I know Alex and Heather are going to pick up on this um, even more, and Robert's already talked about it as well, are the rich individuals and the corporations who make extensive use of tax havens. In other words, those who basically prevent the state from raising the revenue that it needs to carry out its responsibilities. And the point that I want to make here is that that was a problem in the 1970s, perhaps a little bit less so than today, but already if you look back at what was being said then, uh, in fact the chairman of the Inland Revenue, even in 1975, was talking about tax avoidance as a national habit um, in the UK. But I argue that since then this has got a lot worse because of an unstated but deliberate policy of successive governments of transforming the UK into, as Robert has said, the world's biggest or most secretive um, tax haven. If you look at what governments have said about tax avoidance and evasion in the UK, very often they try to present it as this game of, of cat and mouse, where the very clever and duplicitous rodents somehow manage to outwit you know, the hapless feline revenue inspectors. And in actual fact, the truth is rather more sinister than that. And the truth is that far from being the passive victim um, of tax avoiders, the state, through its connivance with the tax planning industry and their primary um, uh, clients, the multinational corporations, they basically have been the primary architect of the system of tax avoidance that we now suffer in the UK. Um, as Richard Brooks has argued, um, who's a private eye journalist, and I forget now the name of his book, what was it? The Great Tax Robbery. Um, now he's argued in that, I mean he's gone into this in a lot more, uh, a lot more detail, but he basically argues that what you've seen in the, in the UK is effectively the wholesale privatisation of our tax policy making system. In other words, now it's not the case that tax avoiders actually have to do anything clever to create tax avoidance schemes because the state is in effect creating those tax avoidance schemes um, for them. The point that I'm making here is that, I mean, Alex is going to talk more about exactly how much revenue is lost, and that's a point of debate because, of course, avoidance by its nature, you've got to define what avoidance is, and it's hardly like you can go to people and say, well, how much tax have you avoided? Uh, you know, it's unlikely that they're, they're going to tell you. But my argument is that irrespective of the amount of revenue lost, two things have happened. One is governments have opted for policies that play into the hands of tax avoiders. So Heather's going to talk more about PFI in a moment, so I don't want to steal your, your thunder there. But I mean, in the UK, the height of absurdity was reached in the 2000s when it was revealed that the inland revenue had actually surrendered the ownership and management uh, of their estate to a Bermudan-based company which actually means that HMRC, as they now are, can't actually collect taxes on its landlord's capital gains. So right at the heart of the system. You're not the only one. Ah, so, so this is going global. So policy transfer in action, great. Um, <laughs> the other thing that they, they tend to go for is they tend to go for policies, obviously, if you can't raise taxes this way, you have to find other ways of raising taxes. So a common uh, route, and again, it's not just the UK that does this, is to raise things like indirect taxes, such as VAT, which again, inevitably hit the poorest sections of society um, hardest. My paper concludes by arguing that freeloading has highly polarizing effects. And for me, that's one of the key things that's fueling the sense of injustice that's eroding the legitimacy of the UK's political institutions, say outward signs of which being things like uh, Brexit. And I think again, this idea that the, the political process is only really reflecting the interests of the rich um, and the powerful, you know, when it was revealed that David Cameron, the guy who was supposedly spearheading our uh, attack on the tax havens, had benefited to the tune of 31,000 pounds um, from um, a company that his father had owned in Panama. Clearly this tended to reinforce this perception that the political system was only looking after the interests of this liberal elite that is now so um, despised. So I'm not trying to argue here that quelling tax avoidance is a panacea to the problems of Britain's governance. But what I am suggesting is that a serious and sustained attack to clamp down on Britain's tax havens will at least help to address some of the sense uh, of grievance who though, of those who increasingly feel that the rich 
basically have representation, but without taxation. Thanks very much.